this morning I want to talk to you about the first Presbyterian cross-country parable. How many of you have ever run cross-country? Raise them high. Uh, so did I. Do you want to know when I ran cross-country? About 50 pounds ago. <laughs> I had been trying to become a gymnast, and I, I was particularly working on the horse. <clears throat> and this is funny. Um, I went to a summer camp and was thrown from a horse. <laughs> Different variety and broke my wrist, and it made it very hard to be a gymnast on the horse. So I turned to cross country, and I would run around uh, this lake and practice. <clears throat> and then I decided I was going to join the cross country team in my high school. So the day came, and I went to the first chance to sign up, and I went to the first practice. And very soon, <clears throat> they took all the runners and they said, We're going to run a course. And I was going to run with them. And the leader shot out. Well, I'm competitive. So I shot out with them. And we did a mile, <clears throat> and I shot out right with them. We did another half mile, and I shot out right with them. Although, of course, we were all moving a little slower now. <clears throat> but I was breathing heavier than they were. We did another half mile, and I started to fade because I had never run a distance in a race like this and gradually they parted from me. Now it's kind of funny, the coach said to me afterwards, he, he watched me for the first two miles and he said, I've got a runner. But he reappraised that <laughs> when he watched the rest of the race. Uh, and I finished, though. And I did one thing the coach had told us. He said, if you can't sustain the pace, you can't sustain the pace, but don't stop. Now, it's surprising how slowly you can move without stopping. <laughs> Um, and so it, it began, and as it began, by the way, I, I was entering a whole new world. Uh, cross country was quite a challenge to me, and I, I began to train very hard. And a couple things I learned from cross country, and it, it's kind of interesting. In the scoring of cross country, if your first five do not finish, the team loses. You could do first, second, third, fourth in a race. And if a fifth runner does not cross, you lose. Your team is considered as disqualified. <clears throat> At least that's the way it was. And so I learned it was about the team. As well as running my race, I had to run the race with others. And I had encouraged them in practice and whatnot. And because we wanted to win, uh, they encouraged me. And, and it made a huge difference. Do, do you realize much in the first Presbyterian church cross-country team parable. If we don't encourage each of us to finish the race, if we, we still have to run our race, but we've got to involve one another. We've got to pray for one another. We've got to be there for one another. We have to love one another. Jesus said, if you have loved one to another as I have loved you, by this 
shall all people know that you are my disciples. Now, if we put that inversely, if you don't love one another, they won't know that you're his disciple, the Christ's disciple. And, and this was a very mind-opening process for me, this, this race thing. Um, back then in Brooklyn, New York, we had gone through, we were one of the first major cities to go through integration. Remember, they did force busing for some of you that are older. And I, as a result, went from a, a fairly uh, monocolored school to a multicolored and multicultured school. Uh, one of the runners on the team was Martinez. I, I tried the hardest to remember what Martinez's first name was. And I don't know because everybody called him Martinez. And he had come from Puerto Rico. Now, in Brooklyn at the time, there were neighbor, each neighborhood had its own little ethnic group that they called gangs. And suddenly, I was running with a Puerto Rican, which up to that time meant that I got ready to fight because that's how the culture was. And we were running together. Another runner was Fidel Cornell. Uh, he was uh, black Hispanic. And I got to know these guys, and we became a team. The others, uh, there was Agostino. Surprise, he was Italian. And Nelson, I don't know, he was Norwegian or Swedish, D Danish something, and myself. And we got to know each other. And half the joy of running was being a member of one another. Does that sound familiar, scriptural-wise? In Corinthians 12, we are members of one another. In J.B. Phillips, it says we're in sympathetic relationship with one another. And I began to understand and appreciate the culture of my teammates. Like one of my teammates had to take a bus for an hour to school. And he volunteered to do it because he wanted to be in my school. And he thought it was a privilege to be there. That thought hadn't occurred to me. But it did. I began to realize the privilege of, of learning together and being part of a team. Y'all, in Southern, Yuns in Pittsburgh, Yus guys in Brooklyn, are members of one another. And that's a privilege. And it's, it promotes understanding it, and it helps how we run. Because there's a joy in it, of being in a team. And, and the same thing in a band, or whatever team you're in, there's a chance to be a part. It's about being there. In Hebrews, we start the cross-country match. Therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses. Now, if you've ever been to cross-country match, most all the witnesses or the audience are in the clouds. Because there's virtually always more people on the course than people watching. There must be signs up that I never saw that say, don't watch this. The Christian life is lived out in its fullness, not before the watching world, like, look at me. It's before the cloud of witnesses. It's, it's before the mom, the dad, the Sunday school teacher, the person who showed you how to run the race. And, and just appreciating that they're there. 
This is probably slightly theologically incorrect. But I can see my Nana, my grandmother, saying, there goes my grandson, little Davy. Only she could get away with that, so don't push it. But what a privilege to know that as we run the race, those that have gone to glory watch with such love. Brothers, sisters, moms, dads, grandparents, young and old that have gone to be with God are part of the watching race. And it's special. It says, let us throw off everything that hinders. I can remember at the end of the year in one of the cross-country races, it was like 20 degrees. And I had my sweats on, and I was about to race, and the coach said, take them off. And I thought, this guy's crazy. But we're not to have anything that would hinder us. And so I took it off. It was actually the fastest race I ever ran because I wanted to get to the finish line to put him back on. <laughs> Let's throw off everything that hinders. You know, there are things in our lives that hinder our witness. I, I try to work on my driving. And I don't put, like, praise Jesus on my car until I get my driving better. But there are things that we do, attitudes and, and how we approach people or fail to be there for people that get in the way. And we have to change. Uh, Richard Baxter, a noted Quaker, he, he just said it, it, it's such a lamentable thing to see how people spend their time and their energy for trifles while God is cast aside. We have a chance to be part of a team, to do what God calls us to do. If God had never told them what they were sent to the world to do or what was before them in another world, then there would have been an excuse, he said. But it is his sealed word, and we are called to profess it. And then it goes on, it says, and let us run. Have you ever noticed that when God is calling us to do something, Almost any excuse is good enough to keep us from starting. God wants you to begin to do something for someone, somewhere, whether at work or in neighborhood or at home or at church. And the time to begin is now. What are you waiting for? Run, and run with perseverance. Uh, Spurgeon, the great preacher of the past century, he said, by perseverance, the snail reached the, the ark. And, and if we just keep going. I told you how that first race, I, I finished, but not too gloriously, the last part. But then I began to I realized that I was going to take it one step at a time. I was going to seek the finish line, just as the Christian is called. Seek you first the kingdom of God. The rest will be added to you. And it says the race is marked out for us. By the way, did you see the cover of this thing? Now, I don't know whether they ran up that mountain, but I guarantee you, if they didn't, there was another mountain that they were set to run up. Do you remember the song, Oh Lord, I don't need another? There are mountains and valleys and hills enough to climb. We do not set the course. We do not set the course. All that we determine is how we run the course. Do you ever get sorry for yourself? I mean, I've been there. I visit there regularly. <laughs> But we do not set the course. <clears throat> we have to face the hills and the valleys in our lives. We've got to face what we have to face. 
I've had a host of valleys and hills to climb. I can't say that I liked any of them, but you lean into it. Ironically, in cross country, I liked the hills because almost everybody had longer legs than me. I thought that was unfair. I told the Lord that was unfair. But when I hit a hill, I figured, this is for short people. And I leaned into the hill, and I would pick up distance on almost anyone. Uh, I was like a mountain goat. Uh, in the hills shows our perseverance. It shows our commitment to live the life. And most of us have had hills and valleys. When my father died, didn't quite know how to deal with it. When there was a horrible disease I once mentioned to you in my family, and there's, I've had a two or three family members killed. Um, we don't set the course. We only make the choice to run it. And we run it by God, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. Fixing our eyes on Jesus. Young William Wilberforce, in England, he was fighting to free the slaves. <clears throat> and to a battle against slave trade. And he lost so many battles. He was thinking that, what's the use? I should just give up. Nobody cares. I'm not going to do it. And he grabbed his Bible, not with a warm, pietistical thing, as sort of like, what's the use? As he did that, a letter fell out of his Bible. It was one of the last letters that John Wesley wrote. And he began to read it again. Unless the divine power has raised you up, I see not how you can go through your glorious enterprise in opposing that abominable practice of slavery, which is a scandal of religion, of England, and of human nature. Unless God has raised you up for this very thing, you will be worn out by the opposition of men and devils. But if God be for you, who can be against you? Are all of them together stronger than God? Your opponents, are they stronger than God? Oh, be not weary of well-doing. Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might. I've said again and again to people, and I've been with people in terrible situations. I don't come because I've got something great to offer. I come because I come with a great God who, who wants to embrace you and hold you and lift you up. And that's how we come. We count upon God for our strength. We stay the course. Stay the course meant that you kept the sail fixed in the right way to, so that the wind of God would blow it to the finish line. I always have this image. It, my, most of my family on my father's side were sailors. They were racing yachtsmen. Uh, I have this image of a sailboat. Maybe it's a big sailboat. Maybe a big enough sailboat to have all of you. And we don't really need God. So I have you all huddled together. And then I say, on three, everyone blow. <sighs> I'm not going to do that. I don't want to spread disease. Um, the boat won't go anywhere. But the wind of the Spirit makes it move. And the wind of the Spirit does it as we do our work of fixing the direction, of staying the course, of holding the sail, of doing what we can do. For the joy set before him, Christ endured the cross. You know, it's fun to run once you get in condition. Not so much fun while you're 
not in condition, because you, you have these little stops along the side of the road. I forget what we did there. Um, but once you start to get in condition, once you get used to running, it's fun to run. It's fun to live a life of faith. It's fun to, to live out your faith. And sure, there'll be opposition, scorning at shame. He sat down at the right hand of the throne of the Father. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners. Once upon a time, there was a TV guy on, and uh, as he was doing this, they were talking about Walter Payton. And they were saying how he ran 900, uh, not, he ran nine miles on NFL uh, fields, nine miles, which is pretty impressive. And then the other announcer said, yes, and every 4.6 yards, somebody knocked him down. <laughs> and they called him sweetness, because he liked to run. So we should not grow weary and lose heart. We're called to endure hardship. It is a good feeling when you're running a race to reach the finish line. And there's usually someone there who's glad to see you, even if it's only the coach. Fix your eyes on Jesus and run the race because the joy of it the camaraderie of it, of being a team for Jesus Christ, is just joy in itself, as well as when the time comes. We really reach the end of our journey and join the cloud of witnesses that have awaited us. And the one who began the race with us and awaits us at the finish, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.